Hi, everybody. Welcome back to day two of GAP Summit 2020. My name is Saili Jungam, and I'm the vice president of GAP Summit. We hope you enjoyed the day yesterday and made the most of the networking sessions. We have another exciting day planned for you today, covering a wide range of topics from the biotech industry across the world and universal healthcare, drug affordability to diversity and bioentrepreneurship. Our first session today is a panel discussion on collaboration across global bioeconomies, chaired by Peter Halley, Senior Vice President, Global Head of Research at Merck Healthcare KGAA. So I'll hand over to Peter now for what can only be an engaging and eye-opening discussion. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Sally. Um, and um, as mentioned, we are talking today about the collaboration across global bioeconomics. And I'm very happy uh, to have a distinguished uh, panel here. Um, so um, I, I will share this panel um, and introduce in a, in a moment uh, John Euler from uh, Beijing. Uh, Professor Maria Mercedes Roca. Um, she will join us virtually, virtually. So we have a virtual forum, and she will. She recorded her contributions uh, prior to this um, summit to, um, for um, technical reasons. Um, um, Pravat from uh, Dr. Redis um, and Dr. Pauline Eschaf, um, uh from uh, Education Sub-Saharan. Um, so before we go into uh, the panel discussion, I wanted to. Um, uh, kickstart uh, the discussion with a couple of slides that I would like to, to share with you about my view of the bi uh, global bioeconomy. And I, I wanted to start with um, an analysis, analysis um, that was actually posted by Bruce Booth. He is a, a venture capital investor uh, with Atlas Ventures, um, has a blog that you can see here. Um, and he analyzed in uh, 2017 the development of investments uh, in the biotech industry. Interestingly enough, as you can see from this uh, chart on the left-hand side, he only, so to speak, um, analyzed uh, uh, clusters in the US uh, uh, and focused on the two main clusters in um, Massachusetts, so Boston, Cambridge uh, in the US and the Bay Area. The rest of the US and, uh, and Europe um, excluded everything else. Uh, but anyway, um, um, and I think it's a very, very interesting analysis uh, where he could show actually that the two key clusters, uh, in, uh, as you can see, in 2012 had 31% uh, of all funding in the biotech industry, and that grew to 48%. So roughly half of the investment in 2016 in biotech were actually only in two clusters in the US. So again, um, Massachusetts um, and the Bay Area at the, at the West Coast. And you saw the, uh, see here uh, that's on relative terms, 100% um, of course grow. Um, uh, um, so there were more investments in 2016 than in 2012. And in absolute terms, uh, you see the stagnation essentially uh, um, in U Europe, rest of US, and uh, the, essentially all the growth came from um, uh, the investments in biotech in those two clusters. So the question is, is this, this the whole story? Um, is uh, Biotech really uh, centered and focused um, to these two clusters that attract more funding, uh, more talent, more ideas uh, over time. And here is a, um, another um, uh, uh, report uh, actually from September this year from uh, Toreya, uh, and they analyzed the valuation across clusters. Um, and yes, uh, what they analyzed is that the Bay Area and the Boston area are still number one and two when it comes to the valuation of biotech uh, companies. Um, and you see there are some, some additional figures. Um, two other clusters in the US on number, number three and four. But then you see already um, some clusters in, in Europe. Um, and number seven, um, uh, Yangtze province in China, South Korea number eight, and then uh, again the cluster Washington um, in the US. Interesting enough, one of these regions uh, is my home region, uh, uh, Rhine region. And it's a good example because essentially the whole valuation is driven by one company, uh, BioNTech, that uh, in the pandemic uh, really uh, went public and, and uh, saw um, um, tremendous growth of their uh, valuation, their share price. So it, it, it shows you uh, um, that um, uh, singular events can really change the picture, and of course, it shows you that uh, especially Asia is uh, Asia is really kicking in. Again, question: Is this all? So we see those two dominant clusters, and some others grow. I, I think the answer is actually no. Um, we are really 
uh, seeing a trend towards a global bioeconomy. Um, and um, the, uh, the underlying dynamic, I think, is, is what you see here on, on the slide. Those are the top uh, 1,000 uh, universities uh, across the globe. Uh, the World Economic Forum did this um, analysis, and you, you really see that when, when it comes to education, when it comes to research, um, academic research, actually we see a globalization. Of course, we unfortunately still see some, some white spots, um, uh, for example, in, in Africa and some, some countries in Asia. Uh, but, but again, uh, the picture looks much, much more global. Um, and I strongly believe that um, the globalization, the digitalization, the virtualization of, um, of education will contribute further uh, to this trend. And um, if you think about the current pandemic, if you are online um, uh, watching your teachers at Harvard, Yale, it doesn't matter anymore if you are uh, um, in, in these uh, cities in, in the US or if you are um, uh, following uh, these presentations in South um, uh, um, America or wherever you are on, on the globe. And last but not least, um, uh, the, if you think about um, uh, growth, we were thinking in the past mainly about GDP growth, uh, all in financial terms. And if you look at the, um, uh, the um, uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations, Yes, of course, uh, uh, finance or uh, access to um, uh, the right resources is uh, part of the equation. Um, um, of course, uh, we already talked about education as an important uh, parameter in, in health, but it really goes beyond. And I would argue um, what we have seen in the pandemic uh, is uh, current pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic is, is a good example. It's not that uh, the richest countries in the world deal with this pandemic in the best way. Uh, not even the countries with the best uh, healthcare system tailored towards uh, uh, age-related disease, for example, but ac actually uh, some countries outperformed here um, uh, that we didn't expect from a pure financial investment uh, point of view. So again, the hypothesis is, yes, uh, we, we see a dynamic growth of the biotech, biopharmaceutical industry. And yes, we have uh, these two major clusters, but uh, biotechnology is more than um, uh, developing innovative uh, drugs uh, for, for cancer, for example, and it's definitely uh, global and is all, uh, covering multiple aspects of, of health. And with this, um, I would like to uh, go back to uh, uh, the list of uh, our panels, panelists and uh, would like to uh, start with John to introduce himself, um, his current role, but uh, John and then also to, to all the others, if you could focus also on uh, the current um, um, system, ecosystem, biotech uh, cluster you are active in, uh, give us a flavor uh, about this uh, would be great. Um, John, over to you. Um, please uh, introduce yourself and get started. Um, sure. Hi, I'm John Euler. I'm the founder and CEO of Beijing. Beijing's um, a global drug discovery company that's 10 years old. We're about uh, 4,450 people. We're primarily focused on oncology, large and small molecule. Um, when we think of what cluster we're part of, um, we actually believe that we're a virtual global company. And we've said since the beginning that we have no headquarters. And I think you can probably see from our logo, we say cancer has no borders, neither do we. And I, I think this is an important concept in the way we've built our organization. We're operating on four continents and I don't know, we, we have double digit number of offices um, that are meaningful. I can't keep up at this point. But I think that, you know, we also are a major player um, in China. We have, you know, a few thousand people there. And, uh, you know, we're pretty large in the United States. And then probably following that, um, Europe and Australia. The caveat in that is, you know, we, we've built ourselves out over time. And, um, you know, I think that we're tied in the US, probably in the Bay Area, we're tied in Europe and Basel. And in China, it's multiple cities from that perspective. So um, I, I, I think we're probably the way many companies are going, although fewer biopharmaceutical companies and really trying to be a virtual global company. Thank you. Great, John. Um, 
let's go to, to Prasad. Um, um, again, same question, introduction, and uh, describe where, where, where you live and uh, how, how the bioeconomy looks in, in your country and region. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I head a company called Dr. Eddy's Laboratories Limited. Uh, we are headquartered from Hyderabad, but our, main, our largest market is the US. And uh, the main markets that we serve are, of course, India, Russia, US, uh, parts of Europe, China, and a number of emerging markets. Uh, we started as a chemical company making active ingredients, small molecules. Then we uh, diversified into finished dosages, largely generics. Uh, we have an innovation-based business in small molecule oncology. Uh, we have a biosimilars business, which is also focused on oncology. And our biosimilars business is largely focused around emerging markets. Um, we, um, we sell our products in more than 60 countries and uh, uh, we develop products for the entire world. Our main R&D centers are in India, but we do have a research presence uh, in Cambridge, UK, as well as Leiden in uh, Netherlands. Uh, and we have some manufacturing around the world, uh, Mexico, as well as the US, but bulk of our facilities are in India. Uh, we have about 20,000 plus people, a uh, large number of them in manufacturing and a significant number of them are sales force. Uh, we spend about uh, uh, close to $200 million in uh, R&D uh, research, uh, largely around generic process development as well as some innovation. Uh, we have uh, a research effort in immune oncology uh, through a 100% owned subsidiary called Origin. Uh, so thus we are a diversified company. Our revenue is around two, two and a half billion dollars. Uh, and we are growing in the double digits in the last uh, couple of years. Um, that's about it. And uh, I'm happy to be here to address the, uh, the future leaders of tomorrow, as well as the alumni of the global biotech revolution. Thank you for having me here. Thanks, Prasad, for introducing you, yourself. Um, over to you, Pauline. Um, you provide us with a different perspective. Um, yeah, please, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. My name is Pauline Essa, and I'm originally from Ghana, but at the moment I'm based in the UK, um, near Cambridge. Um, my background is in agriculture and biological sciences, so this has a particular interest to me in terms of biotechnology. I'm currently the head of research and insight at an organization called Education Sub-Saharan Africa, but I've only just joined in September this month, so it's all quite new. And my focus is on helping to generate research and insight into what works or doesn't work in higher education in, in Africa, really to get the insights to then share the knowledge, data, and evidence with um, a range of, of people who need that information. So students, education providers, um, investors in education, um, funders, policy makers to really have the information they need to design education, really with the purpose of advancing employment in, in Africa, because we have so many youth who just need to find the right jobs, meaningful, sustainable jobs. Prior to this role, I was based um, with the UK's National Institute for Health Research, um, the research arm of the Department of Health and Social Care, really using UK taxpayers' money to advance collaborations between researchers in UK institutions and their colleagues in low and middle income countries around the world. So particularly Africa, but also covering um, Southeast Asia and, and um, South America. And again, that was about building partnerships to address health challenges um, in these low and middle income countries through research, but also through provision of infrastructure in healthcare. And prior to that, I was based at the University of Cambridge in UK where for nine years I helped to set up and was managing the Cambridge Africa program. Again, connecting students, staff with colleagues in lower middle um, in Africa to really advance research knowledge exchange, build partnerships to address challenges on the ground in Africa. And again, biotechnology and biosciences was a big element of, of the work that we did in terms of supporting students and uh, researchers to advance research to then um, lead into transferring knowledge to industry and to, to building um, companies that would focus on advancing growth, economic growth in these countries. 
Thank you very much. And I look forward to an interesting discussion today. Thanks, Pauline. Um, now it's uh, we turn over virtually to, to Maria, who will introduce uh, herself. I trained as a microbiologist and I did a PhD in plant pathology and life took me to the tropics. I'm actually Latin American. I spent 17 years at an agricultural um, university in Honduras. And then uh, I um, uh, started teaching at a medical school in, in Mexico. So the concept of uh, the bioeconomy and the One Health, which I will talk later, the bioeconomy is a very important concept because it recognizes that the, uh, the residues, for example, of one industry uh, are the starting point of another industry. And uh, it's very important for us to remember that the, um, the Americas, and I would say from Canada to Argentina, we are probably uh, one of the, the world's biggest producers of biomass. Biomass, uh, when I talk about biomass, I, I mean food, uh, timber, material, fiber. And uh, the bioeconomy is a strategy that many countries are adopting. Certainly the European Union is adopting in many countries in Latin America. So that is a very important starting point. Yeah, uh, this was the round of introduction. Um, and um, I think we will have a very uh, uh, stimulating uh, discussions. And of course, we'll open to Q&A um, uh, soon. Um, but before we go there, um, let, let's start with the first round um, of, of questions. Uh, John, you, you said Beijing is a global company. Um, and, and yet, uh, you started that company in uh, Beijing in, in, in China. Could you tell us a little bit about what this idea was all about and how you saw uh, the company and also the bioeconomy in, in China developing and, and uh, tell us where you are uh, today. Um, sure. I think that uh, from our perspective, we did believe that there is a um, value in clustering. I think at the time, you know, we started our company, <clears throat> the move to Cambridge and other places was occurring and we see, saw value in that. But I think we also saw uh, and believe that the world's just moving in a direction where information flow and the way younger people work is very different and was going to be very different. And I think that if you think about, you know, cutting edge research, you know, distributing across the world over time and how long that took, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, really you had to go to meetings for that to occur and it trickled, trickled out. And I think at this point, you know, within, you know, five minutes at the beginning of a major science conference presentation, you know, the slides begin to become available. There's dialogue on, on the internet about what's happening. I think it's really enabled the acceleration time-wise of science and of information flow and it's really empowered people all throughout the globe. So the question really was, how could you, you know, leverage some of these breakthroughs that were happening from that perspective? And I think that, you know, we be believed that if you could build an organization enabled by technology, which is unusual in our part, the drug discovery part of the industry, and tap into people all over the world and make them real-time collaborative, of course, you need benches. Of course, you need manufacturing. And, you know, we've built everything we need over time to be able to do that. But I think part of the view was to build an organization that had, you know, citizens from all over the world that embrace cultures from all over the world and that actually didn't have a headquarters. And, you know, the problem with having a headquarters is you declare we're this or we're that. And if you're not in the headquarters, you feel like you're a second class citizen. So, it's hard to do and like building that sort of a culture and a lifestyle and a work style um, has a lot of challenges and trying to understand how to be local yet be global. I think companies have struggled with this for, dec for, uh, for decades, for centuries. And, uh, you know, from that perspective with new technology, you know, we've been grappling with it. You know, speaking specifically in China, you know, I think we're a company that is very strong in China. And, you know, from that perspective, you know, when we got started, um, you know, I think there was little funding for biotech anywhere in the world, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was not like today. 
I think at that point, when you walk through JP Morgan meeting to talk about your business, the you know major investment meeting of the year, you know, you really everywhere you look, there was someone with a business plan and assets that were struggling and everyone needed money. And it really was very, very depressing. And I think, you know, these days when you walk around, you know, the joke is if you sneeze, you know, someone's going to turn and write you a check for $50 million. So, you know, capital is flowing now. I do think that that the point, you know, that you were implying in slides, which is, you know, there is a redistribution and an enablement of companies that don't have to be in the hub. I think that counter trend, you know, has occurred. I still think it's harder for those companies. I think it has occurred. I would actually not say BioNTech's a great company, which it is um, in Europe because of COVID. I think that it's just accelerated a little bit. They're a new technology company who's a true leader in a new technology platform, you know, run by a brilliant man. And I think from that perspective, with a great team and a, a lot of resources and good investors. And I think that it's a perfect example. There's other great companies in Europe, Argenix, that are coming and other organizations that uh, you know, are really wonderful and impressive for what they're doing. And I think that that just is the trend and it's happening from a different perspective. So you know, you know, to, to me, the enablement to build a great team of people everywhere, you, know, you don't need to make every city Cambridge, Massachusetts per se, but what you do need to do is you need to enable a really talented group of people to be brilliant and creative and innovative in their own way, and then have the appropriate resources to be successful. And I do think that the tools we're using today to be able to host this meeting you know, remotely, it's a real tribute um, to what can be done without physically being next to someone. So I think that you know this trend continues, and I also do believe being local in places where others aren't, you just understand the situation better. You understand the standard of care better. You know the key opinion leaders better. You understand the system better. So I think that it really enables all sorts of entrepreneurism all throughout the world in a way that hasn't occurred before. And it's really and truly exciting for our industry, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, great. Um, um, Prasad, uh, over to you. And uh, what, what um, John mentioned um, uh, already, the globalization. Um, um, but you, you mentioned in your introduction uh, that you are focusing on, on the broad range of innovation um, from um, what we call innovation in, uh, in biotech, really uh, uh, discovering and developing new drugs but also innovation on, on the biosimilar side. Could you elaborate a little bit uh, on this, um, yeah. uh, how you see this and uh, how your location uh, plays a role in that? Absolutely. Uh, firstly, uh, let me uh, explain the significance of biotherapeutics and their uh, access to many parts of the world. Uh, today, a very large portion of the therapeutics uh, are bio biologic drugs whether they're uh, uh, peptides or whether they're uh, made through mammalian cells or various methods, a large number of the pipeline uh, products are biologic drugs. And not just in oncology and immunology in the past, they're going to other therapeutic areas like GI, rare disorders, neurology, everywhere, and of course, vaccines now. Um, so this market is worth a lot of money. It's about 400, 500 billion dollars today. And um, the prices of biologic drugs tend to be very, very high because of the cost of development, the sophistication in manufacturing, as well as, of course, the cost of innovation. A large portion of the world, including countries like India, South America, Africa, uh, many parts of the world cannot afford the prices of these products. And uh, that's where biosimilars come in. Uh, and uh, as an Indian manufacturer, we focused on making the products affordable to the local market. And uh, we could get registration with limited clinical trials 
uh, unlike uh, the requirements to market these products in uh, developed markets where you require a full phase three, which can cost up to $100 million, uh, the, uh, the emerging market regulators have largely been uh, you know, cooperative in looking at the data and being more pragmatic about uh, biosimilarity and uh, clinical effectiveness. And uh, um, by introducing these products into emerging markets, which have large populations, which are self-pay markets, not insurance covered markets, uh, we have been able to expand affordability dramatically. Uh, I'll give you an example. I think uh, Redita, Rituximab, when it was launched in India in 2000, in the early 2005, six, I don't remember, uh, the price per vial was $950. And uh, very few people could afford this. And biosimilars entered at about a fourth of that price, about $250. And the number of people treated, or the number of patients who took the product expanded exponentially because of the pricing. Uh, and uh, today, the, uh, the, the, the number of patients treated is over 10 times what were originally treated by the innovators. And we see this repeatedly in Peru, for example, we introduced the same product, demand went up 30 times. Similarly, we see that in many emerging markets. Uh, uh, so biosimilars have, have really played an important role for taking the benefits of biologic drugs to many emerging markets. Uh, Europe has also been a leader in uh, uh, adopting biosimilars. The US has been a little slower, but things are changing there. Um, of course, the cost of developing biosimilars still seems to be uh, you know, very high relative to other generic products. And that's an area I think uh, policymakers need to study and see how they can create greater access to biosimilars, bring down the costs, and hence treat many more patients. The newer therapeutics, therapeutics such as cell therapeutics, CAR T, these are even much more expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars per cycle of treatment. And uh, that limits the number of people that we can treat. So somehow we have to find a way between uh, uh, costs, costs of treatment and access to medicines. And this is where being from a low cost uh, country, we are able to develop products at a much lower cost, make them available to much larger uh, pool of patients and try to be a solution uh, for the emerging world while we try to partner with uh, established players for the highly regulated markets. Uh, this is our biosimilar story and I'm very fascinated by how affordability can you know, make a big difference to lives in the world. So with that, I... Uh, my, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, very exciting. And I think um, uh, fair to say that um, uh, biosimilars are innovative products because they uh, allow larger access um, um, uh, to, to innovative me medicine. Pauline, from, from your perspective, um, um, is uh, price everything uh, that, that we need to overcome uh, uh, access challenges? Uh, so could you uh, elaborate maybe a little bit uh, on this um, and of course also um, uh, talk about uh, the specifics of uh, the bioeconomy um, in, uh, in Africa. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, yes, absolutely. Price can be sort of a game changer in, in especially the developing economies in, in my, my part of the world, in Africa, but also other low and income, uh, low and middle income countries. Um, we still have about 80% of the population in Africa living on $1 a day, and that's the reality. And so if you're having very highly priced um, drugs, very few can afford it, which is why people resort to using um, plant-based therapies handed down from generations down, anything that will be able to, to provide um, and address health issues because the, the cost of um, non-generic drugs are just too prohibitive. And it makes it difficult for people with bright ideas to set up um, new companies, opportunities to try and address these health issues. So definitely having generics and biosimilars is a way 
around that major issue. They're still not cheap, uh, but at least they provide alternatives that people can, can afford. And, and by having those kind of pr um, preferred pricing um, opportunities for those who cannot afford, it means that we can all enjoy good health um, irrespective of financial situations. And so I applaud those organizations that are bearing in mind those who really cannot afford. It's not that they, they don't want to buy at those prices, they just don't have the means. And so it's, I think it's in all our interest to work collaboratively to bring people who are really in those low income categories into a higher level where they can also be able to participate in these global economies. And bioeconomy, bioscience is definitely a way to be able to address this divide that you find, this inequality that you find in terms of economies across the world. Um, and so um, to, to answer your other question, for me, um, yes, in Africa, many countries don't really have a, a strong strategy in place or even any strategy in place to address bioeconomic issues, but it's beginning to happen. I mean, South Africa is probably the one that is most advanced in this area in terms of having a strategy. Um, but other regions and other countries are beginning to show that kind of determination. Um, so yes, it's often happening at the country level or regional. So in East Africa, for example, um, six countries in the East Africa economic area. So Uganda, um, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, they've come together to prepare a strategy for the region to address common issues between them. And I think that is a good way to go because they also have shared sort of economic policies and whatever they have easy, easy movement between the different countries. So it makes it easier and quicker to advance those um, regulations or ideas that evolve from different parts of, of the region to actually coalesce, to be able to advance biosciences at a faster rate. Um, it's beginning to happen. You can see advances in say, um, using biotechnology to improve crop varieties um, that are actually adapted to local conditions. Um, so improving uh, against drought resistance or disease resistance, um, same with animal uh, breeds. So for example, you find that um, a lot of people import meat, um, both, not even both, um, sort of mutton, but also pigs, especially people eat a lot of meat, but we can't produce enough. And so people import foreign breeds, but they come and they just die because they are, they are not um, adapted to the local conditions. And so people are now using genetic modification to crossbreed to actually find the local ones but be able to increase their fecundity, the number of um, litter that they produce or the size of the animal to be able to increase it and improve the production. All of those are helping to develop new agro-processing solutions which are creating jobs for people um, especially the youth and women who often tend to be marginalized and don't have these opportunities. So it's looking bright, but as we'll discuss further on, there are lots of challenges as well that need to, to be overcome. So I think I'll stop there and then Great. allow you to ask further questions. Yeah, uh, and before we go there, um, Maria uh, also uh, recorded a, a statement from uh, the Latin America perspective um, and also elaborating on uh, the One Health concept. So uh, please, um, um, Maria, uh, please play uh, the video. The One Health concept, which is gaining uh, more followers, uh, starting from the uh, World Health Organization, recognizes that the health of uh, humans, animals and plants, and when I say plants, that includes the ecosystem and agriculture, it's linked. So we all, we've also had many advances in the microbiota, uh, what uh, a microbiome is doing uh, for our health, for animal health and plant health. So um, we also know that good health starts with good nutrition. That's true for plants, for animals, and of course for humans. So although um, taking uh, good drugs, uh, taking uh, vaccines, taking uh, uh, having good treatment for COVID, for example, is very important. The same tools are very, very important for farmers. So um, I always get bewildered by this uh, inability of, of uh, society at large to see that when we need uh, medicines for our health, Farmers also need medicines for their plant health. And those medicines are uh, pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers. 
is not enough uh, to, well, we, we would have to bring a balance. And when we talk about the bioeconomy, uh, we have to bring uh, many, many more sustainable tools. So the bioeconomy is something that also should be discussed, which is uh, the, the waste of one industry, for example, agricultural residues can be the starting point uh, for another industry. Uh, so the bioeconomy and the One Health concept are very, very important concepts to consider. Great. Um, coming to the next round, and actually I, I looked into uh, the chat, uh, see that you are very, very active uh, asking already uh, your question. Great. And I think uh, one of the key questions coming from the chat is uh, about the link between the quality um, of the local, regional, um, academic uh, environment and the bioeconomy in, in that region. Um, so both in terms of talents and education, so education and, uh, and talents and uh, capabilities, but also as a starting point for, for, for new ideas uh, for startup companies. Um, who wants to go first? Pauline, maybe uh, you already a little bit, a little bit about uh, how, uh, how Africa uh, is here. Uh, could you start on, on this one and then we hand over to John and Prasad? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, from, from where I sit, that is one of the biggest challenges that we face in terms of advancing um, bioeconomies in, in the Africa region. Um, there, there's so many issues that need tackling. So for example, the academic curriculum, um, often it's quite theoretical and it's focused on imparting knowledge to a certain extent. And I'm generalizing here, obviously there are variations across the continents and within countries, but the, the key aim is to try and make the curriculum more impactful in terms of addressing local challenges um, on the ground in terms of practical ad addressing of challenges, not just theory. So there's a push to try and engage researchers or academia with industry in terms of um, having input from industry on what the curriculum should really look like to be able to generate um, researchers or, or graduates who are ready for work because they understand what is needed in the te technology environment, to be able to provide internships or, or um, apprenticeships during the, the, the degree course within industry for people to be able to understand how the work environment actually is and the kind of creative thinking, innovation, entrepreneurial skills that they need to be able to work effectively and efficiently in these, in these organizations, to be able to create value for money and to be able to actually use that theory they study in a practical way. And also having exchanges, like having the lecturers spend some time in industry, be it a three month sabbatical, something like that, to be able to understand how what they're teaching relates to actually producing things. So we need more investment in training in capacity strengthening um, initiatives that actually provide that knowledge exchange. And that's where collaboration is a really good thing, where you have institutions, maybe in the global north, engaging with those on the ground to share ideas, to provide mentorship, to provide training, to enable them to understand how things are working elsewhere. But of course, you don't just plant what is outside within a, a country and expect it to work. It has to be adapted to the local conditions and local ways of working and the local um, regulations, if there, there are any, and policies to make it effective and sustainable. But a, a, a lot is being gained from these international partnerships. For example, CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency, is spending a lot of funds engaging Swedish researchers with those in Africa to build this kind of bio capacity. And it's leading to all sorts of early stage um, ideas and companies, but that is how we start. And then we begin to grow these um, into bigger into bigger projects that actually have a real impact on economic development in these regions. So those are just some examples. Yeah, thank you, Pauline. Maybe John, because you you have, uh, as you mentioned, uh, not really a headquarter, uh, but really many sites across the globe. Um, and I, I think you can really uh, see the quality of talents and quality of ideas. So how how would you describe this uh, from from your perspective? Well, you know, I think at the at the highest level, I think there's an ability right now for a company being started anywhere in the world to much more effectively build remote training than has ever existed. You know, my daughter's doing entirely remote schooling and it's across the globe um, time zone wise from where we are. 
And if we, whether we're in Asia or in the US or in Europe, that's possible as long as she maintains the time zone. I think that this, you know, training concept to transfer knowledge and wisdom that we have from industry really empowers and makes it more possible with limits. It's better in person, but it enables a lot of mentorship and training to let you almost anywhere in the world access some incredible talent that is available. Uh, and I think that finding the tools, finding the process and enabling that is really important. I think from the second perspective, you know, it's not a new concept in the world that the best and brightest people are mobile. They've always been. They flow to where the opportunity is. They go to where there's other, you know, like-minded people and they travel. And that's happened in Europe. It's happened in Asia. It's happened, you know, for longer than anyone probably has written down, you know, history. And it's just a fact. And I think that we're all competing to try to bring the best people to work on whatever our ideas or our company or our, you know, concept, our cause to get those incredibly talented people to join the effort and to be passionate about it and, and get involved. I do think that, you know, when you think about that, there's a lot of things that enable you to form an organization. There's a lot of things that enable you to get great talent, but it's the obvious things, you know, people are naturally attracted to where they grew up, where they went to university, where they've worked previously, where they know people. They're also attracted to home. And I think that whatever that definition of home is, you know, it's much more enabled now than it's ever been to go back to those places if you wanna be at them, to go to the place that you grew up, even if it's not um, a hub or a center, there's more opportunity and possibility to do that and to be part of a great initiative or a team than there's ever been. And I think that this is a trend that you're seeing. And, you know, before at one point in time, you know, the great centers, you know, whether it was, you know, in China for a time, whether it was in Italy or in Greece or wherever it might be, whether it's in New York or whether it's in Cambridge, you know, I think right now, the great home is probably the internet. And that's probably the place that the most talented people can find each other, can connect, can share immediately ideas, concepts, and push thinking. And I think this is part of the reason that everything is accelerating. The speed of science, the speed of innovative business models, the speed of everything, because information is flowing so much more quickly and we can collaborate instantaneously with each other. So I think it's, it's very different than it's been before, but I do think fundamentally, you know, to the people participating, um, you know, in this session, you know, really we should think about how do you make sure for whatever your cause company, you know, issue is you're facing, how do you get the best people engaged um, in it and how do you attract them? And we need to do the things to make our organization and where we are and the internet all enable this. And there are a lot of things potentially happening in the world that would make you know, free access for collaboration over the, the internet at risk or, or you know, a comfortable place for anyone from all over the world to move and live in that hub uncomfortable. They may not feel as welcome as they did before or these are the things that really fundamentally matter to company formation, to entrepreneurism, to innovation, to, you know, building an incredible, most talented team of people to passionately solve the world's greatest problems. And I think that, you know, we, we all want to do that. That's why we're participating in, in this event. And so these are the things across all of us we need to work with to try to make sure that the environment that encourages all of these conditions, which right now have been perfect, continues. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, John. And, and Prasad, maybe uh, because it's also a question here on the chat, um, um, if you could, from um, a collaboration with academic institution talent, also add the aspect of clinical trials, because clinical trials yeah. usually are run um, at academic centers and 
uh, we, we don't have yet the, the virtual patients who, uh, who lives in the internet, but we are treating in clinical tri trials real people uh, with different uh, genetic background, uh, different um, underlying uh, um, yeah, nutrition, uh, underlying uh, health history, and, and, and so still very diverse when you look uh, from a global perspective. So uh, how can you run uh, clinical trials uh, either globally or locally and then make the, the data not only available, but also useful for other regions of the world? Sure. Uh, firstly, I, I have a slightly contra view uh, to John about uh, location. I think location really matters. Uh, if you look at uh, your own uh, slide, which you opened with, uh, a disproportionate amount of funding goes into these centers. And there is a reason for that. I think there is a very strong ecosystem. And certainly China is getting there with a huge amount of government funding and all that. The ecosystem for innovation requires fundamentally innovative people, which is academic uh, and research organizations. You need uh, funding. You need uh, the VCs, the private equity players who are able to take risks and put risk capital, uh, which is reasonably long-term, at least in our sector. And the third one is you need uh, 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 you know, a critical mass of entrepreneurs to create that, uh, you know, that system of supporting each other and creating aspirations among people to build innovative enterprises. So I, I do believe that um, uh, globally, new hubs are developing, new centers are developing. Um, while the internet is a great leveler and a great connector to ideas, I, I still think uh, the physicality uh, is important. The physical presence uh, of uh, innovative people, uh, funding, as well as uh, the, the ethos of entrepreneurship. Uh, it's no surprise that you know Massachusetts and uh, San Francisco have a huge amount of all these. They have the best academic institutions creating uh, Nobel laureates, doing fundamentally very uh, you know, innovative work. Then you have the brightest students from the world gravitating to these places. Then you have the venture capitalists there. Uh, increasingly, I think China is building these centers, these hubs, and a lot of government funding is pouring into innovation. Other economies like India and all are trying to make a difference, uh, connecting academic uh, institutions to uh, you know, incubators and accelerators and government funding. But you know, uh, these, these hubs that you mentioned have a very unfair natural advantage, which will still uh, you know, suck a lot of capital and talent and uh, enterprises into the, in their uh, uh, locations. So I, I do think uh, governments, countries, if they want to build their nations have to invest in innovation, they have to strengthen their academic institutions, create the ecosystems for innovation by providing funding, the right environment for risk capital to flourish, all of that. And, um, Today, I think it's a very bipolar world. There are a few countries which are racing ahead and many of them are struggling. So I, this is my contra view from India, what I see. Mm -hmm. uh, on the subject of global clinical trials, I think uh, it's very much uh, being done. Uh, all innovator companies are doing trials across the world and uh, countries do require you to do local trials uh, if uh, the data doesn't have uh, the genotypes that are uh, particular to that geography. So um, while uh, a lot of the patients tend to be uh, in the countries of uh, where the drugs originate, I think uh, the uh, most uh, innovator companies do have an inclusive model for clinical trials, global trials. And uh, countries like uh, India, China now do require local trials. If you don't have as part of your global trial, enough patients from the loca location, they will require you to do the trials. So I think um, that is happening. Of course, uh, certain countries still have to evolve their regulatory system to ensure that uh, their populations are also part, part of these trials, but a very large uh, ethnic, ethnic diversity is part of the 
uh, global trial system today. So uh, I'm um, not sure if that is adequate, if more should be done, but it is there today. Uh, that's my answer. Thanks and uh, good to have also a little bit of uh, controversy here, uh, sharing different views, uh, great to see. Um, but let's say, let's follow this, uh, this hypothesis. Um, is it then the right um, uh, move to, to copy what has happened in, uh, uh, in Massachusetts or Boston, Cambridge uh, um, uh, and in, in the Bay Area? Um, Pauline, it probably would take uh, a long, long way from establishing the uh, academic infrastructure to, uh, to the venture capitalists, the entrepreneurs. And, and so uh, is the idea uh, to copy or is, it, is the idea uh, to um, build on the, the local uh, specificities, um, again, from, from your per, um, African um, perspective? I think you can get the best of both worlds. Definitely, you want to focus on local. Um, because that's where you understand the challenges the most by engaging with the people on the ground and also making it as multidisciplinary as possible. You're not only talking to education, you're talking to people in policy making, people in the public um, domains. You need a range of people with a range of skills, cultural scientists, behavioral scientists, um, what do you call it, policy makers, social scientists. You need a range of people to come together but of course you need the funding to be able to make things happen. And as someone said in the chat, if you don't have the existing skills in place in industry, how do you start? And that's where collaboration becomes really important because to me, collaboration is the new innovation. That's where a lot of things can start. Those who have the funding or those who have the technological know-how can engage with those on the ground who have the local knowledge about what has worked in the past or hasn't worked, what the real challenges are on the ground that need addressing. And together, by bringing your minds together and the expertise and the funding, that's when you can start to build really sustainable uh, biotech industries or training programs or whatever. And I, I agree with um, Dr. Eddy that actually having a presence on the ground makes a difference. That is what you need at the start to then be able to do the engaging via virtual means. Um, but definitely you need that presence on the ground initially to get local buy-in to explain to people communicating your messaging about why you're doing what you're doing because these are novel technologies that people don't really understand and so you need buy-in from the locals and so there's nothing like being on the ground to have that local engagement um, copying and just depositing what's happening elsewhere in these regions don't really work you can adapt and that's what tends to be more sustainable if you copy and bring it you turn around, hop on your plane, go back home and people stop using whatever it is that you brought because they don't really engage with it or understand why you're doing what you're doing. So it's about adapting and collaborating to get those ideas, the funding, the, the know-how really embedded on the ground. But you need that local ownership as well. People need to know that it's their uh, business or their product and you are investing in it because there's mutual benefit. Because again, it's not about helping those poor people. That doesn't work either. So it, it, it's quite multifaceted, but it can work with the right people and with the right due diligence and with the right understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, that, that's my take on it. Okay. And John, I want, of course, uh, to give you also an, an opportunity to, to respond. Um, and, and, and maybe also thinking about uh, the example that, uh, that you mentioned, uh, uh, rightly so, so uh, uh, Biontech uh, is an example for one very, very bright uh, scientist um, and, and long-term funding from a um, private business angel, essentially, uh, that, that took off uh, after 10 years of very, very hard work. And so, I, by the way, I fully agree that uh, COVID just accelerated this. Um, so is this possible um, or, or do you always need this, this, uh, this uh, uh, ecosystem that uh, Prasad uh, described? Um, sure. Well, look, look, I think that hopefully, hopefully one thing people will take away is, you know, you can respectfully have slightly different opinions of how the world might evolve. And you can do that in a forum where, you know, the truth is no one knows what is going to happen in the future. That's the reality in life. It always surprises us, which makes it beautiful. And, you know, look, uh, you know, 
I think there's there's truth absolutely, you know, in, in you know in in the points that were made unquestionably. And the right answer isn't one or the other. It, it's going to be what happens, and so we'll, we'll, we'll see. I think that you know, on the clinical trial topic, it's something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, this is where the industry for innovative medicine spends ninety percent of its time and money. I'm sure that your organization does too, and it's not something that's done well. It's not. It's something that's evolved over time. It has been much more separate than together. Recently, it's become much more together, which I think was a regulatory set of actions that have helped. But you know, for example, if you have a new, exciting, broad IO target that comes out of your research, you could easily immediately have the need to invest 500 million in a clinical program for it. And like, if you wanna be in the game, that might be the ticket to competing. And that's a tremendously large number if you want to make it available from a global perspective in many indications. And if you're competing with the Mercs of the world or the Roches of the world, you're going to need to do that. So from that point of view, you're basically you know, in a challenging situation. So why is that the case? The trials are very expensive, they're very clunky, and for the most part, they're only run in a small portion of the world's population. Until five years ago, you know, most of the big global trials for the big innovative products, they don't enroll patients in India, they didn't enroll patients in China until the last minute, if at all. And you know, largely it was US, it was Europe, and it was a little bit of Japan, maybe some Latin America, one or two places every so often. But it really was a small fraction of the patients that are available from a global perspective. A lot of the cost is related to the time it takes to enroll a patient. For a lung cancer trial, it might take you two years from the time you start the trial until you enroll 800 patients. You might work in you know, 35 countries and you know, 140 sites. It's very logistically hard. It's very expensive. It takes a long time. A lot of these sites only enroll a couple of patients. The technology solutions aren't very good. And the way that our industries evolved, there's a middleman. Most companies work with third-party clinical CROs that you know, aren't trying to optimize the system and the technology. They're trying to optimize their bottom line. And you can't blame them but that's the way the industries evolve. So it's hard for even the biggest companies to optimize the system and make it as efficient as it could be. It's also very difficult for a key opinion leader. You could take the best key opinion leader at the best hospital in Europe or the US, and if they wanna go back and plug themselves in in Asia, plug themselves in in Africa to a hospital there, people aren't gonna run clinical trials with them because they'll say the hospital may not be GCP, which is regulatory quality. But I think there are tools that we can put in place in those hospitals that are technology driven that could enable those hospitals to be sure that they're GCP, make it much easier to ensure that's the case. There's a lot of things that can be done to this. And I think it's 90% of the cost, it's 90% of the time. This is the single biggest opportunity to improve drug discovery and development in the world. And I believe part of that solution is locally enabling great key opinion leaders wherever they might be around the world. You name any country and there is a brilliant clinician that was educated at one of the best places who has gone back because they love their country or they love their parents or they just wanna help. And in those places, we've got to enable those people to build clinical trial centers that plug in, that they can truly become part of the great global clinical science. And I think that the next five to 10 years, we'll see that and it'll have tremendous, tremendous impact. And I think there's a whole ecosystem around that that starts once that begins to occur. And although in an ideal world, you have a hub like Cambridge, you know, it all starts with one seed. So enabling that seed to be planted and sprout many places across the world, I think we'll see a lot of you know, tremendous things spring up. And it's our obligation as an industry to really enable this you know, entrepreneurism and plugging into you know, the real initiative, which isn't you know, Beijing 
It's not Dr. Reddy's, it's not Merck, it's how do we you know, fight disease and how do we help people? I think you know, this is the next 10 years of our industry and it really fits with the social aspects of what you showed on that last slide too. Thank you. But Pauline, um, do you see already uh, such a development uh, in, in Africa clinics uh, um, um, adapting to uh, higher standards so that they could be um, used as centers for global clinical trials? Are there um, uh, case studies already? Um, yes, for sure. I mean, again, a lot of this information doesn't come out, but there are lots and lots of clinical trials that take place in in Africa, especially in relation to nutritional studies and or malaria, because often they see that, oh, if you're studying this uh, in, in the most vulnerable population or most uh, undernourished, then you get the most extreme results that you are possibly going to get. And so actually there are some societies in parts of Africa where they almost call it clinical trial town, where every clinical trial on earth they've been exposed to in some form because also it's the incentive is to provide them with free healthcare. And so actually there's an issue of exploitation in those cases where people are being used continuously as guinea pigs in a way for clinical trials and that, but that is another story. But actually there are occasions where people are starting to invest in actually learning and being able to develop their own clinical, uh, in fact, drug discovery pipeline. And so you've got African researchers based in um, University of Cape Town or whatever, who are starting to build that capacity and that infrastructure to be able to go from bench to, to bedside and to be able to produce authentic Africa built um, clinical trials and actually be able to address some of those health issues. Because for too long, we've been dependent on people outside of Africa handing down this kind of expertise. And I think people are waking up to the need to actually start to do some of this, but again, in collaboration because we're coming from the back foot where it's a nascent um, technology that we're adapting in Africa. So a lot of it is through collaborations and a lot of it is through external funding because there's limited funding coming from a lot of the governments. So it takes time, it takes um, bright minds to come together from different parts of the world to make it happen, but it's starting to happen in Africa. Yeah, and maybe a, a second question there. If you see these um, uh, uh, new startups uh, that you were talking about and, and uh, clinical trials and the, the knowledge around it, is the goal to develop high price drugs that will be launched first in the US? Because there was also a question <laughs> here around, um, is the, 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 are the high prices in the US and uh, the IP protection, um, all of that, is this really driving the global bioeconomy? Because that's the, um, uh, the, the highest uh, financial upside and therefore everyone is striving for that? Or do you also see their uh, trends um, towards a different kind of business model um, uh, going um, like biosimilars, which uh, is going more towards uh, access, but also on the innovative side? Do you, do you see trends there or is it still, we want to launch the drug first in DS and make the uh, most uh, uh, from a financial point of view out of it? I think there's a, there's a mixed scenario, but mostly people just want to be able to advance the economic um, position, but also to save lives. And a lot of the time it's become clear that depending, that, that dependency that has been created through the existing models are not sustainable. Africans need to start to take control of their own destiny and their own future and start to invest in learning and being able to produce some of these, these uh, facilities themselves. And a lot of it is coming from Africans in the diaspora as well, who have gained knowledge and experience and expertise from all over the world. And they see how much resource, natural resources available on the continent of Africa and the amount of talent and the young people. At the moment, it, see, it seems more like a disadvantage, but actually we can turn all of those into competitive advantages to be able to really make the most of the, I mean, we've got 60% of the world's arable land is in Africa. By 2050, one in every three young person will be from Africa. There's so much that we can do on the continent with the right approach, with the right attitude. At the moment, it's not about money and making that economy. It's about saving lives because people are dying every day from lack of access to food, to nutrition, to health. And so there are basics that we're trying to address. Eventually, the economics will, 
they will focus more on profit. But right now, I think there's more about sustenance. Yeah. Maybe let's switch gears overall. Um, and uh, because there was also a question on should there be um, global funding um, uh, equally spread around the globe? Um, uh, should there be uh, other focus areas such as uh, just focusing on uh, the health needs of the mature markets? Um, and I think if you think about those two elements, um, uh, the current pandemic, of course, uh, has elements of that. So we are all in, in, a, in a health crisis uh, that we, um, some of us may anticipate it and, and prepared for, but the, the world is, uh, overall didn't, did not prepare for. But what we also see on the positive side is a strong collaboration between different players, um, a willingness of, uh, foundations, governments, uh, and the likes uh, to invest in, in, in biotech and make things happen, a regulatory flexibility. Um, maybe uh, Prasad, uh, I know India is also a country uh, uh, hit by, by the pandemic um, and uh, collaborating with many, many other institutions on, on the global scale. Uh, do you think that this is just a one-time situation or will it increase the collaboration between different bioeconomies? Um, the, I mean, I'm very positively amazed by the depth of collaborations that are happening between various players in the world today, whether in development of therapeutics or uh, vaccines, uh, collaborations for manufacturing, collaborations on supply chain, collaboration on clinical trials. Uh, it's, it's just unprecedented, uh, the level of uh, uh, collaboration that I'm seeing between governments, private companies, uh, hospital systems, and all of those, and the speed with which uh, we are racing ahead in terms of repurposing existing drugs, licensing the drugs to be manufactured wherever the manufacturing infrastructure exists, and also uh, making, uh, you know, offering each other uh, facilities and, uh, uh, you know, products. So for example, Gilead uh, licensed Remdesivir to many players to make it available to 138 countries, uh, royalty-free. And this was an amazing gesture. Uh, we've seen uh, collaborations between Japanese companies and Indian companies to develop products. Uh, all the uh, vaccine producers of India have one or other arrangements to make the vaccine and make it available uh, for the populations around the world. So I think uh, the pandemic has driven a lot of players to work together, to collaborate and find the solution that we all need to find. Whether it will become a new normal, I'm not sure. Uh, once when things come back to normal again, you know, um, we will all face uh, shareholder pressures, all of that. Uh, but, you know, but this has been a great lesson for healthcare companies, companies in the ecosystem to see how we can take care of each other much better in a much better ways than we were pre-pandemic. So I think there is a model here. Uh, and uh, building on the earlier question about whether uh, countries should copy the hubs, I think each country can have its own strategy and uh, suitable to its own uh, strengths. Uh, for example, if you, if you see India as a IT services giant today, uh, while we don't have the innovative companies like Google or uh, Microsoft here, we have millions of people serving companies around the world through backend of this, uh, this, uh, software services. Similarly, in the, uh, uh, in the um, um, pharmaceutical field, we have companies offering uh, services, drug discovery services, medicinal chemistry services, biology services, manufacturing services, and eventually they'll move to innovation as they mature. So each, I think each uh, bioeconomy must develop its own uh, strategy to participate in the global ecosystem of uh, uh, biotechnology. And, uh, I, and I also agree with what John talked about uh, the inefficiencies of clinical development. The bulk of the cost of getting a product to market is the clinical development cost. And there is scope there to make it more efficient, faster also. If you rely on countries uh, which have large populations, 
your re patient recruitment is also much, much faster. So I was just wanting to complete that question. But otherwise, I think uh, we have seen unprecedented collaboration and I really hope it continues. Mm -hmm. John, one time uh, um, activity or is it uh, there to stay uh, beyond COVID-19? You know, I think it helps. Uh, and I think that it probably will change and create some policies that do encourage global collaboration. It also has hurt. Um, it's hurt because I think like supply chain and logistics, there's not been incredible behavior at all times. And, you know, medicine that was intended or protective gear that was intended for one place was you know, held up or the supply chain was disrupted. And I think that one of the results of that probably is going to be in the industry that as you develop a medicine, you need multiple, you know, supply sources, um, which in the short term is going to put a strain on the system, but it's also going to increase the cost um, at an early stage of developing a medicine. So that's unfortunate, um, but understandable. And I think that, you know, the other risk which I wouldn't say is COVID related entirely. I just think in general is the risk around, you know, can, you know, are, you know, different groups of people around the world get along and figure out a way to work together that's going to be collaborative. You know, if for a second we separate on key issues like, um, you know, health related issues, food related issues, you know, these are truly global concerns. And if there's one area that the world should agree and get together and try to work together, it's, you know, fighting disease and fighting for life. And clearly we're better having one system and having pre-information flow and having, you know, the ability to, you know, have one system. So you're not repeating lots of actions and you don't take longer to get an innovative, helpful medicine to people. And I think that that's a tragedy in the system historically, which step by step over my lifetime has gotten dramatically better in every way. And I think that has completely moved in the right direction. I just hope that continues in the right direction. It would be really sad to see things happen that you know, caused us to regress to where we were before. Um, ultimately, the science works the medicine being developed now is very impactful in oncology, but it's going to be in um, neuroscience and a lot of other areas. The science is working. It just needs to be translated now. And there's going to be incredible continued steps. They're well on the way of happening. The issues around being affordable. And, you know, I personally don't believe that anyone in the United States or Europe should have their family bankrupt because they can't afford a medicine that our industry is developing. And I believe that we can't say we've got to wait until stuff gets generic until billions of other people in the world can afford to have access to it. You know, we're on the path to a system that would have uh, affordability like we've never seen before, but we need to, you know, keep that path and make sure that the things that are driving us in that positive direction, which we have, the world's been going in. It's incredible what regulators have done. It's incredible the way the world's working together towards that for the last 10 years, but we just need that to continue for the next 10. And I'm very, very big believer in much more affordable medicine, helping billions of more people around the world. Well, Dean, maybe also from, from your perspective, uh, with a Please, a short answer because we want to have a closing round. Uh, um, so, how, how COVID 19, the pandemic, has changed uh, uh, the bioeconomy in, in Africa? Well, I think it's, it's given everybody time to pause and actually think about what we've been doing and what we could be doing going forward and who are the right people we need to be speaking to, partnering with, and what are the new ideas that we can come up with. Um, given the many challenges we have, at, at least in Africa, in a range of issues, be it in terms of regulation. I mean, it's a nascent uh, bioeconomy that we are growing and a lot of the legislation and the, the uh, policies are not in place yet. What can we do to line up the dots to make sure we've got all the different um, hurdles being, being covered? And, and so I think people are having those conversations. How do we transfer knowledge from universities to industry or, or vice versa? 
and how can we make the most of this time that we've been gifted um, to actually make sure that we move forward at a rapid rate, but also be making sure that these strategies we are developing for bioeconomy are linked to the sustainable development goals because there's a lot to do in the next 10 years to meet um, the, those, those, to address those challenges. So how can we kill two beds with one stone and make sure that we're advancing all those major challenges that we already face and using bioeconomy uh, activity as a tool, the technology as a tool to really advance people's lives. So I think there's a lot of thought going on. There's action in the background. We're still needing a lot of investment to be able to make um, these plans into concrete um, actions, but I think people are using time wisely to build those networks. And as, as John was saying, the internet is a great thing. You can still communicate without getting on a plane. So a lot of that is happening at the moment. And I think we have to stay positive and, and see this as an opportunity and to bring in the, the leaders of tomorrow who are thinking of these challenges and how they can contribute and take things forward as well. So I would say there's a lot to do for those of you watching and listening, and you can play your part in, in making this, this a global success, not just for parts of the world, but for all of us. Thanks, Pauline. And overall, we have to unfortunately close this uh, discussion. It was really, really a, a pleasure. We, I think, highlighted uh, where we are as an industry on the global scale, how collaboration can accelerate it, uh, accelerate the, the progress. Uh, and of course, uh, that there are many, many gaps uh, to be closed. And uh, unfortunately, I have now to close uh, the round uh, without giving you the opportunity to talk about the biggest gap and how, uh, your commitment. But I think um, everyone uh, got from our discussion that we are very passionate about our industry, very passionate about um, global uh, health and uh, in all aspects, uh, and that collaboration and not copying is, is the, from my point of view, uh, the right recipe uh, to bring the global bio economy forward. And with this, um, yeah, again, thanks to everyone, uh, uh, Pauline, John, Prasad, uh, Maria, virtually um, in, in the virtual uh, setup uh, for contributing to, to this panel.